Greetings ladies and managers and welcome to this latest narration of the web series The Survivor Becomes the Dungeon. If you are new to the series there is a playlist listed down below in the description and as always I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 129 But Maury Point of View Once I had left the Adventurers Guild's training hall, I decided to do more shopping around for the Haven. Mainly, all that entailed was going from store to store around the inner city, checking the prices for various goods and sundries. All in all, what I saw painted a pretty clear picture for the average citizen of this frontier fort town. From what I can tell, the average household of three can thrive off two to four silver pieces every week or two, depending on how many preserved or fresh goods that they get their hands on. Beyond that, creature comforts and low-grade luxury goods are rather easy to obtain, as they are readily available in the inner city amongst quite a few stores. My guess is thanks to the heavy amounts of farming and ranching that is done out here, processed goods and made of things like wool, furs, feathers and cotton are available for relatively cheap, though I'm sure that if I were to look for these goods in the capital, they'd like to be two or three times more expensive due to transport costs. And again, a poor town just might have an even more readily available luxury goods. I'm getting off topic. I'm starting to think there was a reason I was never interested in being a trader or a merchant. I just don't have the head for macroeconomics. Anyways, based on my best estimates, I'm going to need a total of 19 gold pieces. If I'm going to get enough blankets, pillows, wool, and other kinds of thick furs to pad out jackets and clothes. Not to mention the extra materials to make said jackets and clothes for 30 people. I do feel a little bad for Miriam and Sylvia, as they're likely going to be the ones to make the clothes for everyone. Though, considering that I'm helping take care of the food situation, it might be able to free up a couple of the other adults to be able to help out. Or maybe they can even take some of the kids and start teaching them a trade if they haven't done so already. Aside from those materials, supplying a group of 30 with enough food and preserved goods for a month is going to cost another 5 gold pieces and change according to what I've seen. The mental list I've compiled is comprised of 40 pounds of salt, 5 pounds of coarse sugar, 40 pounds of flour, 30 pounds of grains, 30 pounds of beans, 30 pounds of rice, 2 pounds of herbs and spices, 15 pounds of salted beef, 15 pounds of sausages, 2 barrels of pickled fish, and 2 wheels of some kind of yellow cheese. I may be overestimating just how much 30 people eat. Or perhaps I'm underestimating how much people who aren't used to the apocalypse grade rationing are used to eating. In any case, this should be a good foothold for them to start off with in regards to the winter preparation. It'll be up to them going forward if they want to continue to focus on food gathering or if they want to pursue other paths in preparation for winter. Then again, this is all worthwhile taking into consideration that another 50 people, along with an undetermined number of construction workers and mature drakes, will be moving on to my land in the coming weeks. I'm very certain that the Drake Wardens will be able to more than handle their own preparations, but I suppose I should check in with them once they start their own plans on settling my land. Since I had the coin for all the foodstuffs, I ended up getting all the shopping out of the way first. While I made sure to spread out my purchases between four different shops, I think I still ended up attracting a little bit of attention when I used my spatial magic to pack everything into my storage. I think it may have been something to do with the fact that I'm using my storage space without casting any noticeable spells or distinct magic. I mean, I did see someone who looked like an adventurer of some kind pull multiple items from a bag that was not physically big enough to have fit in all those items. So, it is likely that while spatial magic is not necessarily uncommon, my casual use of it might be noteworthy. By the time I was done shopping for food, it looked to be around noon. Given that Lugosi and the cubs had been with me the entire time, I decided it was best to let them rest back at the inn. Even Freddy, who enjoyed being around people, was admittedly tired after being around so much constant activity. After dropping off Lugosi and the cubs, I decided to dress down a bit and stashed away my armored coat, my cloak, the belt with the loop for my sword. Once that was all stashed away, I looked like the average man as far as I could tell. Well, a crippled man, if I considered my missing arm... All I had now were my boots, my canvas pants, a long-sleeved green shirt, and a single black glove. Pulling my satchel on, I made my way out of the merchant's district again, and began looking around at the various stalls before coming across one building that looked fairly nice. There was a sign in the window claiming to buy gems and crystals. It looked to be some kind of pawn shop, if I was looking at it right. 
The store didn't have a name, but had some kind of sign with an emblem that had an old-fashioned scale that had coins on one end and a box of swords on the other scale. As I made my way into the shop, I suddenly felt a few sets of eyes lock on my back, and they seemed to linger there until I stepped out of the doorway. Odd. Making my way further into the shop, I'm greeted by a birdkin man with a nearly glossy black and vaguely purple feathers. Greetings, welcome to Corvid's Baubles and Blades. How may I help you today? He asked in a rather cheerful manner. There were a few other patrons in the shop and two more attendees who polished items or wiped down counters. Regardless, my eyes focused on the birdkin man as I couldn't help but smile at him. Covered. Isn't that a little on the nose or beak, as it were? I mused as I approached the counter. The birdkin man chuckled softly as he gestured to himself. Well, sir, if you have a look, you may as well play into it, he said cheerfully enough, before leaning forward on the counter with his elbows. My name is Edgar, my good man, and how may I help you? Do you need a loan in exchange for your time, or are you here for some other business? I shook my head at the mention of a loan before offering Edgar a bit of a smile. I'm here to sell, if your sign is still accurate, I asked as I gestured to the window with my thumb. Though as I mentioned the sign, one of the attendees seemed to watch me curiously, and I could feel them getting closer to eavesdropping for whatever reason. Edgar looked intrigued as he regarded the sign for a moment before bobbing his head. Yes, we are still buying. What have you got? He asked as he stood tall again, but still leaned forward on the counter with his hands. I flashed an almost relieved smile and sighed softly, as it made it seem like I was really hoping the sign would be true. At which point, I made a show of digging through my satchel and producing a black shard of a diamond and gently setting it on the counter. I have a few of these. Do you perhaps have a private room where we can talk business? I asked, now lowering my voice as I glanced around the shop, as if I were a little uneasy. Edgar looked clearly intrigued as he eyed the jewel for a moment. He then stepped away, pulling open a drawer as he collected a small box before walking to one of the counters and raising a panel that would allow me to walk behind the counter with him. Come along, let's take this to the back room. He then looked over to the attendants and called out, Man the counter! I plucked the gem from the counter and followed Edgar to the back, and before long we were in some kind of office. It wasn't nearly as nice as Tilson's, but it looked nice enough to me. He led me to a sitting area and gestured for me to take a seat on a small couch that sat across another similar couch with a coffee table between them. After setting down the small box on the coffee table, he approached a cabinet and opened it up, revealing a small selection of bottles as he glanced over at me. Would you like some wine? I've got a wonderful bottle from the north made with some rather delectable vicar berries. He asked pleasantly enough as he plucked the glass out for himself. I simply offer a polite smile before shaking my head. No thanks. I've already had enough to drink with lunch. Edgar bobbed his head intently, pouring himself a glass before corking the bottle and putting it away. With a glass in hand, he settled on the opposing couch and took a drink before setting it down on the table. Now then, may I see the gems in question? He asked as he opened the small box he brought and procured a loop. Of course, I replied politely, before reaching into my satchel again and procuring a pouch with six diamond shards, along with the seventh which was loose from the rest of the bag. Edgar eyed the pouch curiously before taking up the black diamond shard, bringing it up and examining it with the loop. He hummed thoughtfully as he turned it around again and again. Is it real? I asked with a hint of unease in my voice. With that question hanging in the air, Edgar couldn't help but glance at me with a sense of pity welling up in his heart. He took another look, more thoroughly examining the black diamond shard that he had in hand, before setting the loop down and holding the shot out for me to see. This is one of the most pure diamonds I have ever seen. There is no cloudiness, and the black tint is certainly an uncommon one. If you don't mind my asking, where did you get these gems? He asked, setting the diamond down and regarding the pouch that he assumed had some of the gems inside. Maya let out a heavy sigh and smiled as I made a show of rolling my shoulders to relax some more. I got it from some adventurer who hired my wagon to bring them here. They initially just paid me with two of these gems, but a couple days ago, one of them accidentally locked over a lantern and set fire to my wagon. There was nothing that we could do to put it out, especially after that barrel of rum ignited, I explained somberly, running my hand through my illusionary hair before shaking my head. I then gestured to the barge in question. To pay me back for my lost goods and wagon, they gave me a few more of those gems, since they claimed they didn't even have enough coin on them. 
and sighing once more, I just lean back against the couch and do my best to look a little defeated as I recall the events of the last few days. I'm just hoping to make enough to buy a new wagon and cover some of my lost goods. Edgar bobbed his head intently, looking me up and down once more before taking up the pouch he ended the knot and picked inside, before nodding some more as he looked over the blue diamond shard. I could sense he believed my story, or at the very least, didn't think that I was any kind of thief as he regarded me once more. How much are you looking to get for these? Well, uh, how much are they worth? I asked while gazing into his eyes. Edgar held my gaze for a little while longer before looking at the gems over once more. By my estimates, each shard could go for a good eight gold pieces, he started to say as he studied the black diamond shard once again. Praise the gods! I enthused under my breath before sighing with relief. At that, Edgar does give a little wince. Now take them off your hands, but I've got to make a profit here too. Can you do three gold per shard? There he goes. Even in another world, pawn shops loan ball their clients. I make a face at his words, showing no small amount of despair and belief. But, but, but you said that it could go for eight. C can't you give me more? How about six, at least? I asked, sounding a little frantic, but still under control of my emotions. Edgar made a little grimace as he considered some things. There is no guarantee that I'll be able to sell these right away. I'll need to take the time to even find anyone who's even able to afford gems like these, he lied, as he then, then hummed a bit before looking me over again. I can do four per shard. Can you live with that? He asked while holding his hand out and shaking on the deal. I just sigh a little more before meeting his hand and shaking it. C could you give me some gold in silver pieces? Edgar just offered a bit of a smile as he nodded. Of course, sir. I'll get it together for you, he said as he stood. Though, as he stood, I heard movement coming from outside the office. Footsteps going away from the door and back to the front. The next ten minutes went by as Edgar handed me a pouch of 28 gold pieces worth of silver and gold. All in all, I turned quite the profit with just the remains of some dead bandits. I'd do my best to at least look a little dejected as I shook Edgar's hand on my way out of his shop. Though, as I walked to the door, the same attendant that was eavesdropping earlier seems to match my pace as he goes up to one of the windows and out in the corner of my eye. I watch as he grabs a statuette that was on the windowsill and turns it 90 degrees. Once I'm outside, I feel a similar set of gazes locked onto me again, but this time they stay with me even as I start heading down the street. Looks like I might have to see some action soon. End of chapter. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.